Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. One of my favorite verses in all the Bible is one we're going to look at tonight. You can tell how my days have been. This morning, when I started thinking about what to preach about uh, today, I'm considering it kind of a New Year's message. Um, 2 Corinthians 5.17 is the first verse that came to mind. You probably know it. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away, or my translation says, the old has passed away. Behold, look, watch this. That's what behold means, right? The new has come. And I think that's an appropriate uh, passage for, that's an appropriate verse for New Year's. And so I started thinking, okay, I'm going to preach 2 Corinthians 5.17. But then I started reading the rest of the verses and I thought, oh, I can't leave them out. So I want to show you the verses and then we'll come back. Read along with me here. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through the end of that chapter, verse 21. Here it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Did you notice a key word repeated several times in that passage? Oh, it has a few different endings, but you see it in verse 18, reconciled. The last word of that verse, reconciliation. In verse 19, reconciling. The end of verse 19, reconciliation again. And in verse 20, he says, be reconciled to God. What is a reconciliation? What does it mean to be reconciled? You know, you can't enjoy or glory in verse 17. Christ makes all things new. Hooray, that's great. Until you know what it means to be reconciled. Because verse 17 means nothing without verses 18 through 21. So what is reconciliation? Well, in short, you know, we got some folks here that used to work in a bank. A reconciliation is when you make things right. Like when you're balancing your checkbook. How many of you do that monthly? <laughs> Probably not many hands going to go up, but the, 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 the thought is there. You bring it down to zero. And when you take it to the realm of personal relationships, it's when... You know, it's when two people who were at odds no longer are at odds. Two people who had a problem, a beef with each other, they make it right. They shake on it. They bury the axe, right? And so when Paul here talks so many times about reconciliation, that is, it's closely tied to this idea that we are made new in Christ. And listen, it's already the 6th of uh, January. Um, I didn't make any resolutions this year. I, may, I, I made some goals, but I'm not big into resolutions because they're, they're done by the halfway through January. But I made new goals for myself. Listen, it's really, it's natural, right, to want to turn over a new leaf, start some new things at the beginning of a new year. Um, maybe you made some resolutions to lose some weight. Maybe you made some resolutions to read your Bible every day. Maybe you made different types of resolutions for your, for your family. 
But I want you to know that if you really want to have a new you in this new year, you better get this message because it starts right here. It starts right here. In fact, I want to take you through three steps. Uh, somebody made a joke this morning about pastors that alliterate. I am going to alliterate today with the letter M. And the first step is this. There is misery. I think I put too much Z in that. There is misery. <laughs> We're going to the state of misery here. There is misery without reconciliation. Now, when it says here, reconciled, be reconciled, the, the clearest, if you're wondering, well, you know, if this is talking about a, a relationship being made right, well, who's it talking about? Is it talking about, hey, I should go make my relationships right with my friends that I have a beef with? That's true, right? Jesus said, if, if you got a problem with anybody or if anybody has a problem with you, you uh, before you go to church, before you try to act spiritual, go make it right. But that's not what this passage is talking about. For the clearest idea of what this passage is talking about, it's given in bright, bold letters at the end of verse 20, where it says, be reconciled to God. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, well, me and God don't have a problem. Me and God are cool. Me and God are tight. And, and I want to preface this. If you are a Christian, if you have repented of your sins, there is a sense in which you are, you are already reconciled to God, right? This is already true about you. But what about people that are not Christians? What about people that are not in Christ. I want to reveal to you some interesting things. You know, verse 17 says, if anyone is in, is in Christ, let's do some logic, right? If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. So if anyone is not in Christ, they're still the same old them. Behold, the old has passed away and the new has come. If you're in Christ, if you're not in Christ, the old still dominates you. You can't escape from that. And that's a problem for you if that's true because the Bible says that before we come to Christ, we are enemies of God. And you might say, well, I never declared war on God. It only takes one party to declare war. And the Bible says very clearly that God is the enemy of man that is not in Christ. Look at this. Ephesians chapter 2 describes unsaved people, people that are outside of Christ, as children of wrath. What does that mean? Does that mean they're walking around angry all the time? No. It means that they are under the wrath of God if they don't get saved. Look at this. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 9 describes... We, we believe that Jesus is coming back again, right? Right? That's going to be a glorious time for believers. What's it going to be like for unbelievers? Not so great. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, look at the key words here, in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God. Have you ever thought, oh, it's not such a big deal that people aren't Christians? Guys, people that don't know God are going to experience G uh, inflicted vengeance from Jesus himself. We sing all these songs about Jesus, little Jesus, meek and mild, and that was true when he was born. That's not going to be true when he comes back. On those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they, listen, will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction. This is serious business. Because people that are not saved are the enemies of God. In fact, look at it. If you were wondering why I'm using that word particularly, because Paul says in Romans 5.10, if while we were enemies, and there's that word again, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more. Now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved? There, there's good news in that verse, right? We will be saved if we're reconciled, if we're made right with God. But if we're not, we are enemies of God. 
And why is that? Why are unsaved people enemies of God? Go back to our text. Verse 19 says, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. And here's what it means to be reconciled, not counting their trespasses against them. So if you're not reconciled, God is still counting your trespasses against you. It'd be like if you went to the bank or, you know, if you, if you, if you, if you go to a jail and instead of you're arrested, instead of going to jail, they make you pay a fine, right? $10,000 fine. Well, until the fine is paid off, you owe them money. It is counted against you until you pay it off, either through money or community service or jail time, however they figure it out. Well, you have been and I have been storing up and every day generating a debt to God that we must pay. It's called sin. Every day when you wake up, you sin. Did you know that? It's true. You might say, hey, I'm a pretty good guy. I'm a pretty good gal. The Bible says if you've broken any of the Ten Commandments, you stand guilty before God. Have any of you ever lied? Of course you have. That's one of the Ten Commandments. Have you ever looked at another person and lusted after them to have relations with them? Of course you have. That's one of the Ten Commandments. Have you ever said the name of God in vain? Like, oh my God, or Jesus Christ. I know it sounds strange to hear it up here, but you see it on TV all the time, don't you? And you don't bat an eye. Maybe you say it yourself. Guys, these are offenses against God. They are sins. And the Bible says that until you are reconciled to God, He counts that against you. And, and we already saw from 2 Thessalonians what happens if you meet your fate in your sin. You will suffer eternal punishment. Where is that? That's in hell. I am so glad the rest of this passage has some good news, aren't you? I am so glad the Bible doesn't stick us here. Because even though there is misery, eternal misery, Misery. And I, before I move on, I want you to think, are you in Christ today? Answer that question for yourself first. Then think about those that are close to you, your family, your children, your parents, your brothers, your sisters, your aunts, your uncles. Guys, God has so sovereignly and providentially placed you in their lives to be a witness to them. There is misery, eternal misery, without reconciliation. But thank God, there is metamorphosis. Oh, man, I'm, I'm glad you used that illustration. Because that's, you didn't use that word this morning, did you? You did? I wasn't paying attention. I know. I'm worse than the kids. You won't count it against you. You won't count it. There you go. I appreciate that. There's metamorphosis. There's change and radical change. The Bible says in verse 17, in, if anyone is in Christ, now there's that if, but if you meet that condition, if you meet the condition of being in Christ, that is, you are saved, that is, you have repented of your sins, you have trusted in the name of Jesus Christ to save you, and God will forgive you. If that is you, you are a new creation. You know what? A lot of people want to be a new creation without being in Christ. They want to flip the calendar to January 1st and make resolutions and say, I'm going to do better. I'm going to be better without submitting themselves to Christ. And this is where uh, the message kind of folds into Christians as well. Notice at the end of verse 20, Paul is talking to Christians when he says, be reconciled to God. You might be in Christ. You might have been saved 40 years ago. And you've been sitting in your pew for 40 years but if you don't wake up every day and submit to Jesus, yeah, you're still saved, but you need to be reconciled to God, my friend. Being in Christ precedes becoming a new creation. You're no longer an enemy of God. Why? Because your trespasses are no longer counted against you. If verse, look at verse 19 again. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. 
Do you, have you ever wondered, have you ever thought, stopped to consider that is what God is doing when he saves you? It's not that you stopped being a sinner, right? <laughs> Be honest. It's not that you stopped being a scumbag. We're all scumbags. Some are worse than others. There's a, there's a man in the church every single Sunday. He says, hey, scoundrel. He doesn't know how right to the mark he is. We're all scoundrels in God's sight, aren't we? But God doesn't count it against us. Amen. Not because we deserve it, but because Christ died for us. Because verse 21 is true. For our sake, he made... When, when, when verse, verse 21, you got to get your pronouns right, don't you? There's lots of he's and him's. Who is it talking about? I'm going to put it in layman's terms here. For our sake, God the Father made Jesus to be sin, and he knew no sin, did he? He was perfect. He was the spotless lamb of God. He never took God's name in vain. He never lusted after somebody. He never disobeyed his parents. He never broke the Sabbath. He never broke any of the commandments because he is God in the flesh. He's perfect. And why did he make him sin? So that in him, there's that language again, in Christ, we might become something that we're not naturally. When you were born, oh, it's so hard to believe. It's true of Evangelina, four weeks old. She is not the righteousness of God. She is a little sinner. Now, do I believe that God would take her straight to heaven if she passed away tonight? I do. I believe there's some buffer there. I don't know where it stops, but I believe that. But as it is, if you're not in Christ, you are unrighteous. And so Jesus, did he become a sinner? Oh, notice the language. He didn't become a sinner. He became sin. A lot of scholars think that that means he became a sin offering. I kind of like that. Because time after time after time in the Old Testament, we see them offering sin offerings, cutting that neck, pouring out the blood, and it was a sin offering. And they offered it up because they were saying, hey, I know I'm guilty before you, God. Thank you for letting this lamb die in my place. And that happened thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of times until the perfect lamb of God was offered. And his shed was blood, look at it, for our sake. And he became something that he was not naturally, sin, so that we could become something that we are not naturally, un. Righteousness. And how did it happen? The word is imputation. Verse 19 says he didn't count it. He didn't count it. This is a word borrowed from banking, and it simply means to put to one's account. Um, every once in a while, we still share a bank account with my father-in-law. I don't know why. Natalie refuses to let it go. But there's like 50 bucks in there. <laughs> Just the minimum amount to keep it going, you know. She's had it since she was in high school, and she just wanted to keep it. Well, every once in a while, my birthday, her birthday, I'll check it, and it'll say, 50 bucks deposited, Mark D's. I'm like, hey, thanks, Dad. He imputed something to my account, something I did not earn. Isn't that right? I mean, I know I'm an awesome son-in-law, but I did not earn that $50. He gave it to me. Well, the Bible says here that God imputed something in two different directions. When Jesus died on the cross, he, he took our sin and he imputed it on Jesus. He counted it in Jesus' account. And he took Jesus' righteousness and he imputed it to you and me. something we did not earn. Jesus earned it for us. Isn't it beautiful? Isn't it wonderful to see? We're no more enemies. Heaven is now our destiny, which brings me to the third M. Misery, without it. Metamorphosis, by it. And then there's a mandate to do it. There's a mandate. What is a mandate? It is a command. 
When a commander gives you a command, do you really have an option whether or not you're going to do that? Not in the military, not unless you want to face the wrath of the commander. Look at this, guys. There is a mandate of reconciliation. Not only does he say in verse uh, 20, be reconciled to God, there is a command to believer and unbeliever alike to be reconciled to God. But look at this. There is a ministry and there is a message of reconciliation. He uses this language in um, verse 18. He gave, in fact, it says he gave us two things here. He gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And then in verse uh, 19, he says he entrusted to us, same type language, right? He gave us the message of reconciliation. And I'm going to say uh, that I don't believe they're very different, the ministry and the message. They're really one and the same. And he uses this language in verse 20. Look at it. We are ambassadors for Christ. Our, our young boys in their Wednesday nights are called royal ambassadors. What is an ambassador? What do they do? Well, who are they? Well, it's interesting. You know, uh, Paul wrote this, and he was a Roman, wasn't he? He lived under the Roman uh, government. He was a Roman citizen by birth. And, and it's true uh, that back then, there were two different types of provinces. If you didn't live in Rome, there were two different types of provinces. There were senatorial provinces, and there were imperial provinces. Senatorial provinces were the provinces where the people gave themselves up. And they said, we welcome you, Caesar. We welcome you, Rome. Come do with us as you will. We want to be a part of your empire. The imperial provinces were the ones that put up a fight. And so what happened after Rome subjugated them, they would leave an armored garrison there. So what would happen is, occasionally, Caesar sent messengers to these imperial provinces. And you know what they were called? Ambassadors. The ambassadors had a message to deliver to Caesar's enemies, those who were still in rebellion against him. Are you making some connections here with what your job is? They knew what the message was, and they delivered it without fail. We, and when I say we, I mean you. I include myself, and you should include yourself. Are Christ's ambassadors sent to declare to a rebellious people the peace of God that is available in Christ. Now, the problem is a lot of people don't know that they're enemies of God. And so you kind of have to start there. You can't go up to somebody who doesn't know they're in a war and say, Hey, did you know that God wants to give you peace? I didn't know. I didn't have peace. You've got to convince some people that they are an enemy of God. I would say you probably have to convince 95% of people of that first. Most people think, God loves me. God will forgive me. I've done more good than bad. I'm not Hitler. <laughs> Is any of that true? It might be true. It doesn't matter. One sin will send you to hell. And we've got to convince people that they are enemies of God. But then... This is where a lot of Christians don't, they're very good at telling people, oh, you're a sinner, you're a sinner, you're a sinner, you're going to hell. But then you've got to declare the peace of God. You, God wants peace in the world. And it's not going to be some manufactured, phony, political United Nations peace. It's going to be peace brought about through the individual hearts of men and women. And it happens when people submit to God and live in peace with His will. And you are an ambassador of that peace. You are. The Bible doesn't say here. You know, Paul says that the Corinthians were ambassadors, not just the apostles, right? The Corinthians. You say, how can I... Maybe one of your resolutions this year was to ask the question and try to answer it. How can I be of greater service to God in 2019? Can I tell you? Yeah, you can look for a ministry in the church. You can do that. But the greatest thing you could do is be an ambassador. God has put you in a particular place 
with a particular circle of friends that I don't share. You know what your job is? Be an ambassador. Because here's the truth. We love those people, and we, and, and, you know, we go to family gatherings, and we, we go to ball games, and we go, we go to the store, we, we go to people's houses, and we're friends with them, and we think, oh, they're so nice, and they're so loving, but if they're not in Christ, they're enemies of God. Don't forget it. They might be your best friends, but if they're not in Christ, they're enemies of God. And who better to let them know that than their friend, their loved one. This is going to surprise somebody, but I, I want to get a couple of volunteers. Uh, Tony and John, would you all come up here real quick? I'm going, to, I'm going to give you an illustration of what it means to be reconciled. So, Tony, you come over here, and John, you stand over here. There's further apart. <laughs> I'm going to let Tony represent God. Big shoes to fill, buddy. Big shoes. And John, you're going to represent sinful humanity. Small shoes to fill. I appreciate you doing this. When God, it says, when we are in Christ, we are reconciled to God. I have the biggest shoes to fill, maybe. I'm Jesus. <laughs> I'm going to make the cross, the sign of the cross. Now, let me, give me your hand. Now, give me your hand. It says that God was, God was reconciling the world to himself. And so at the cross, sinful humanity and God the Father come together and join hands. Amen. Now, the Bible says that you are given the ministry of reconciliation. You know the message. It's your turn, people. It's your turn to lead somebody to the Father. The Bible says when you point them to Christ and they come to... God's already there in one respect. We bring them to Christ, then they are in God. They are saved. They won't suffer eternal punishment. They will be reconciled. Thank you, fellas. Thank you. They will be reconciled. That's your job. He gave us the, the, message of re the ministry of reconciliation. He entrusted to us the message of reconciliation. So here's my conclusion to this first message of 2019. Before we do Lord's Supper, here's my question for you. I've got a couple challenges. If you're not saved, I'll be, this will be quick. If you're not saved, I hope there's one thing you take out of this message. Be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. You are an enemy of God. And you might say, I never chose to be an enemy of God. It doesn't matter. Men, women, and children are in open rebellion against their creator every time we sin. And until we come to Christ, we are living in rebellion of God, and you are a child of wrath destined for wrath. But... There's good news. You can be reconciled. You can come and be folded into God and be saved. Here's the second thing. If you are found, if you're a Christian, be an ambassador this year. Be an ambassador. It's your ministry. Not just the deacons. Not just mine. Not just Tony's. Not just the Sunday school teachers. It's your ministry that God has given to you. The ministry of pointing people towards reconciliation. Here's your, here's your goal. Implore. Paul says, I beg you, be reconciled to God. When's the last time you begged somebody to be reconciled? That's your job. Let's have, uh, Brian, let's have uh, one or two verses of an invitation, and then we're going to go into Lord's Supper. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you. That you, have been, that you have reconciled us to yourself. But, Father, there, be, there are some here who have not been reconciled. In a group this size, it's inevitable. There are some here who have not, by faith, repented of their sins and trusted in Christ, the one who died for them. Father, make it happen today. And for those who are saved, may we resolve this year 
to be bold, to be ambassadors for this good news. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with me, please.